You're listening to Parasearch UK Radio. News, views and reviews from the world of the paranormal from across the UK and beyond. Find us on Facebook, Twitter and the World Wide Web. Parasearch UK Radio. expressed by presenters and guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Parasearch UK Radio or its affiliates and sponsors. Listener discretion is advised. You're listening to The Spirit Dimension with your host, Kerry Greenaway, right here on Parasurge Radio. Good evening and welcome to The Spirit Dimension. I'm, my name is Kerry Greenaway, and I do apologise, we're a little late this evening, and I hold my hands up, that's all down to me. Anyway, tonight I have a very special guest in the studio. I like to bring you something a little different on a Sunday, something a little bit, you know, different from the norm, and tonight is no difference. I have got one of the most knowledgeable men I think I've ever met in my life. His name is Mr Andy Mercer. And tonight, following a theme we've been following recently, we've been talking about all things Norse and Nordic. We're looking at runes tonight. Good evening, Andy. How are you? Hello. I'm not too bad at all. Yes. Um, yeah, I know it's about that sort of topic. I don't know who Norm is, but I am different to Norm, definitely. Definitely. That is <laughs> definitely who you're not, is Norm. <laughs> <laughs> now, we have been talking about um, Norse mythology quite a lot over the last few weeks in fact you joined us on one of the friday shows didn't you yes it was a very interesting conversation definitely it was interesting to see you could test the knowledge of you guys the research you'd done and i thought just sit back and you can tell me it all and i can tell you yeah it was all pretty good yeah (laughs) help with pronunciation a little bit though i think (laughs) yeah we was a little bad on the pronunciation weren't we (laughs) Well, that, that's it's nothing not unusual. Well, no, it's not easy. I'll be honest with you. At least there are. It isn't um, obvious sometimes. Like English, you know, sometimes you look at words and you think they'll be pronounced one way, and they discover they're pronounced completely differently. So no, it was um, a lot of those words are quite long and several syllables in them. So it's not difficult to get them wrong. It's quite easy to misread them. Yeah, they're quite tricky sometimes. I find. Anyway, mm. um, one of those things we didn't really cover because we were doing the show tonight was actually a form of divination. Or like, like symboli alphabet is kind of what they like, isn't it? They're runes. Yes. Um, well, all, all alphabets to a certain degree work the same way. They're, they're representations of sounds to create, obviously, words. Um, it's a question whether runes were ever actually used as a general form of communication or if they were specifically used for magical purposes. There are, there's evidence to suggest that they're more likely to be mainly used as magic for um, things such as putting on weapons and protecting people and spell creation, that kind of thing, rather than being a day-to-day used language. I mean, I've come across these. They're in lots of metaphysical shops. They've sort of, like, become part of the norm now, and they sit on the shelf next to tarot cards and, you know, um, crystal balls and that sort of thing. So they've become quite, quite part of the normal, everyday divination kind of tool, haven't they? Whenever I've looked at runes um, in regards to that, it's been a bit hard to understand. They're more a concept. Each rune is more of a concept than it is a this means that, isn't it? Absolutely. They, each one has an individual meaning of its own, which then can be combined, much like tarot cards. Different combinations of runes will create different kinds of effects. You can also use a number of runes to create a reading, but also you can combine rune symbols together to create what are called bind runes, which contain various letters that are designed to have a particular effect or particular purpose. But I'd like to just go back to what you were saying a moment ago about the fact that you get them in the shops. It's um, it is true that runes have become one of those sort of modern divination tools, but the ones that you get 
appeared in the shops have got a rather interesting history to, to them, which you might find quite interesting, actually. Yeah, please. <laughs> well, the rooms themselves have gone through something of a resurrection from the 1950s sort of onwards, because unfortunately, as you probably recognise, and many of our listeners do recognise, that the Nazis made use of runes in their um, symbolism for their uniforms and insignia. Um, unfortunately, they have then created this very strong link that existed certainly in the years immediately after the war that they they shouldn't be even looked at or touched or used because of this um, connection with um, the Nazis. However, a few people tried to resurrect the ruins, shall we say, which is a great and noble thing to be doing and include trying to introduce a form of um, divination and daily usage for runes. Unfortunately, what's happened is that a chap called Ralph Bloom in the 1960s, late 50s actually, came up with a set of runes which he published a book about and you could buy the book and the set of runes but they're a modern construction now what i mean by that is that they're the 24 runes that you see in the set that he provides in the book the, the symbols themselves are kind of drawn from various sources and they are they're not really historic they're like a modern construct but the, the, the thing he did that was really annoying was he introduced a blank rune called the weird rune which has no history of whatsoever it means absolutely nothing and has never existed previously in any kind of writing or research or anything and the reason why he did it was because you could buy the plastic rune tabs that came with the book but because the way they were made it was easy to make 25 at a time instead of 24 because it's five by five it's quite easy to make the molds for them so rather than throw away the bit of plastic or discard it they decided to incorporate it into both the book and the pack but it's complete nonsense there's no um, weird rune there's no blank rune the weird is the concept of it's a bit like fate um, a bit like destiny that kind of thing the weird w-y-r-d runs through the runic readings through all the meanings there are, there's the connection if you like it's the, mm. the, the weird of the world so there wouldn't be a rune to represent what is inherently in all the runes so that absolutely ridiculous so i like the fact that the runes have come back into popular usage that you can buy them in your average new age shop but the versions you're picking up in the shops are absolute rubbish because they are a modern construct based around ralph bloom's book and minimal research he carried out back in the um, the 1950s there has been an attempt to have a more genuine historic runic revival and you are starting to see people who are using things like what are called the norse runes which are 16 letters rather than 24 okay. there's also the Anglo-Saxon and Anglo-Frasian, which are around about 30, 33, 28 runes. I, there are different local variations of the Anglo-Saxon ones, so the numbering and the style is slightly different. But we tend today to talk about four main sets, if you like, four futharks, to use the term. The word futhark comes from it like the word alphabet, which is alpha and beta. The first two letters are alphabet. The futhark is the first six or seven runes of the runic language, if you like, the runic order. So it's futhark. Um, the aforementioned um, elder or Germanic or um, futhark, which is the 24. Now, they're neither elder nor particularly Germanic because, again, they are a version of the 24 that seems the most correct number, but the various designs and shapes and patterns of each rune has varied depending on which part of you you're looking at, which parts of Germany, for example. You know, there, there is great variation. In fact, back in the 1930s, a um, researcher called um, Siegfried Kummer put together a chart, if you like, a list of 22 different variations of this same runic order, if you like, that were found in various parts of um, Central Europe. And they had subtle differences of variations, both in design, sometimes it's slightly in the order. So there was no very obviously set order to the runes, no obvious set that was, this is the versions that are the correct ones. There were a number of different ones. So you have the Anglo-Saxon ones, which came, again, mainly into the UK from sort of the early Middle Ages and earlier even, after the um, the Vikings, the, the famous Vikings you guys have been talking about, but before sort of the Norman invasion, there was a period of time where the the Anglo-Saxon runes kind of developed by themselves. A lot of the people who came across were the Saxons, i.e. from getting Germany and combined with the Angles, that's a lot, so yeah, Anglo-Saxon. Mm -hmm. And again, you find those in different parts of the UK and Northern Europe. There's, I say, anything up from 28 to 33 runes in that set. <clears throat> Then you have, across Scandinavia, predominantly the 16 of what's called the Younger Futhark. Now, that's because they came sort of into usage of a like in the sort of ninth, 10th century. And so there's 16 runes in that one, which is interesting because you see a contraction. The Futhark, the um, elder or Germanic Futhark is older 
but you see a contraction in numbers. I think it can be, and there's more added to it. There's actually some being taken away to produce a 16. Then there's the ones that I've written about, which um, have an interesting history in themselves because they don't go any further back really than to the beginning of the 1900s. They are they're not uh, historic in terms of being used for centuries or been around for centuries, but they are the Armanen runes or Armanen runes that were essentially created by a chap called Guido von List. Back in, say, 1904 and five, he was writing very early on and formulated what he considered to be like a, a mystical or esoteric runic set. They weren't... Well, he would have said they were historic because he believed that they were the original, earliest runes of all that he saw in a mystical vision, which um, he claimed to have had whilst he was um, undergoing cataract operation from his eyes. He was blindfolded for 18 months, couldn't see. And during that time, he had this series of visions oh. about... 18 runes now there's a poem called the hammerval which again is um icelandic actually but it's it's one of those better known poems to do with runes and runic magic and it contains these 18 rune poems which describe individual well they describe something now what von list claimed was they were describing individual runes now the lines themselves are a bit vague so you can't necessarily say they're talking about what they're talking about in particular i mean i'll give you an example um far which is basically an f which is the first letter of futhar the hammer vowel actually just says the first is help which will bring thee help in all woes and in sorrow and strife now it's not saying if that's a rune, it's not saying if that's a spell or if it's a magic, it, it's just these 18 verses. But because there were around sort of 20, 22, 24 runes, he kind of was able to match up some of the known meanings that existed previously for these runes and fit them into what the poems were saying, what the verses of the Hammerbell said. So he essentially came up with 18 runes. Some of them were slightly different. Some had their definite meaning changed and some of them he changed the order slightly but they are what you would call esoterically charged as in they were specifically brought into being for esoteric if you like, magical purposes or to be part of creating a kind of germanic identity that it was trying to sort of foster if you like trying to build up so that was the, the modern armor and runes now the original mythical origin of runes which we touched on on the other show is from odin who according to again the hammerval hung from nine knights from the windswept tree sacrificing himself to himself to great knowledge of essentially the runes and there was a passage that says he screaming reached down into the earth and pulled out basically pulled the runes out so that, so as far as um, von Liszt was concerned, he was having a kind of a parallel experience to what um, Odin had in mythical times, if you like, where he was able to pull up the Armanen runes and resurrect them. Now, one of the important things to know is that often the Armanen runes have been criticised because it's been claimed they were used by the Nazis, which I can absolutely guarantee, assure you totally, is complete rubbish. They were actually banned by the the nazis they when they first came to power in the early 1930s they basically made pretty much all mystical societies including the arm and room guys were, were banned or made illegal um some of the leaders basically disappeared off the face of the earth a couple of them ended up in concentration camps so to say that they were then going to use these runes seems absolutely ridiculous what was actually being used by the nazis was the elder food thought that i was talking about before yeah. which is the 24 runes that came mainly originally it's from germany so that was the runes that they were using so to say that the Armin runes were the ones is nonsense. But unfortunately, the label has stuck. And often if you go on to things like runic forums, on things like Facebook, you start talking about the runes, people make several assumptions. They're going to assume you're some kind of neo-Nazi far-right loony, which I'm nothing of the kind, as you well know. And you often find yourself having to explain in some detail as to exactly why it, this is the case, that people have this misconception. And it's not incredibly clear, actually, as to why people have this misconception. I mean... You can argue that people who were involved in rune research in the 1930s were researching different sets of runes, and some of them became more directly involved with the early Nazi movement, but that the Nazis themselves were a political party. They weren't using runes for anything other than um, because they were popular at the time. So this whole notion about them being the, the Nazi runes is ridiculous, but unfortunately that problem persists. But that's what we basically have, the four sets of runes, the, um, the Germanic or Elder Futhark is the most common, the ones you tend to see in the New Age type shops you're talking about. Okay. And 
again, they're a modern construct. They're based on a number of different runes sets, if you like, that have, that have been found in terms of the design. They're, they're not as standardized as they now appear to be. They never were historically, but that's the ones people use. Some people like to use the el- the um, younger Futhark rather, which is the Scandinavian ones the Vikings tended to use. And then you have the Anglo-Saxon or Anglo-Frasians are sometimes known. You find in France and the UK, they're not very common in terms of modern use for things like divination, but you do find books and articles on them. And then you have the Armin runes, which mystically predate all the others, but in reality date from about 1909. I'll now take a breath. <laughs> I was going to say, my goodness, there's an awful lot of information there. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realise that there were, like, basically four different ways of looking at this. I mean, I, it sounds very confusing, very not sure mm. of historic references when people are using these. So you're getting these tools and you have no idea whether or not what you're using them for is actually, you know, correct because it sounds so confusing as to which methodology that you're going to use or, you know, where the actual understanding of those runes came from. By and large, yes. I mean, you there are lots and lots of um, examples of these rune inscriptions to be found in all sorts of items all across all across Europe. You know, from as far afield as Turkey up to sort of obviously Scandinavia and Iceland. But mm-hmm. there's, there's they're not one uniform set of runes. It's a bit like languages of Europe. You know, we buy, most of the languages in Europe use the same characters, the same letters, but they use them in different ways, different orders to create different words. So. You know, a word spelt in German, for example, is by and large using the same letters of the alphabet as we're using. Okay, the things are umlauts, the, ha- the little dots above, and that kind of thing. In French, you have the accents, etc. But you don't know to use those here. But by and large, they're using the same um, letters, yeah. and that's the same runes. They kind of look similar across Europe, but they might have slightly different meanings or put together in different ways. So, but the, the main examples we've got tend to come from physical objects like um, weapons and armor, because the Probably made of metal, so they've survived the centuries. Yeah, I was going to say the symbology of, of runes, as, as you find them on, like um, there's been little totems that have been found and on armor Ooh. and stuff like that. So, where, how do you start to begin that process of understanding what that particular symbol means? Because yes, you can trace it back to an origin. Because, like you say, you can across Europe and then you go okay that's predominantly in that area it must be something to do with um you know Anglo-Saxons or Vikings that area but how do you then go that means that I mean we know that uh, was it von Liszt who had mm-hmm. who'd had the mystical experience mm-hmm. I mean Odin is a mythological character so we can't yeah. really sort of go to that so how do how does that process happen that, I always find this fascinating, is how, how do you know that means that? Well, it's a fair degree of what you might call backwards engineering. You know, have this modern interpretation now, and they've pretty much, as they constructed a modern meaning for a particular rune, and they'll look back in history to find examples that kind of fit that description. So it's not, because it's not organically grown, if you like. It's not like one system that's grown over the centuries. I mean, you can kind of argue that, for example, tarot has more or less, since the 1700s, had pretty much the same meaning. Mm. They've been developed and changed a little bit over time, but they tend to be, you can get a design of tarot, for example, from the 1700s, rather, and it will look roughly the same as you do today. In fact, some of them are reproductions of those designs, but you're talking much more complex imagery in terms of what appears on a tarot card and lots of proper examples you can find but the roots aren't quite like that because first of course they're very simple they're very easy to draw Mm -hmm. but that's that doesn't necessarily mean they're simple to use because they're actually very clever in the sense that there's a lot of meaning capturing that simple four or five um, straight lines that form each room because as you probably notice all rooms tend to be straight lines because designed to be carved on things whereas tarot cards were like bits of paper cardboard etc the the runes are designed to actually be used in a real world setting if you like you know you put them on your armor you put them on your um, equipment you're using it to cast spells if you like so they tended to be written on things like leather and wood that didn't last so the only things you have left as i say are the metal versions now you can have translations of them again as they don't necessarily look like they were used as day-to-day language but they would they knew what their words meant obviously in the bud of a language you look at be it a scandinavian language or a germanic language they knew what the it, it meant it was 
put on the item to have the particular effect. So you can deduce some idea of what the meanings of each letter was and what they represented, but what they they meant mystically, if you like, what the, the deeper meaning of the rune symbol that was being used. You are really going back to things like people like von Liszt and the people in the Central European research and the sort of the end of the 1800s and early 1900s to get a real idea of the beginnings of the meanings then. So in many ways, the, the Von List stuff is almost like, well, we can trace this exactly because it's like one person who started this off. If I give you like a parallel example, which hopefully, if anyone is listening, <laughs> might actually follow what I'm talking about here. Yeah. When you talk about ceremonial magic um, or high magic, you're talking about things like the grimoires, which are like the books of magic and working with demons, etc. You know, there's no, you can't sit down and say, well, they came from, the, from I don't know, Greece, Greece in the 1100s. You, know, you can't. You can't trace down where they came from. These documents kind of sort of popped around the 15, 1600s. Some of them are older. You've got things like the Testament of Solomon, which is third century. It's, you can't say, yes, that's where they came from, because they kind of pop up all over the place. That's like runes. They're kind of all over the place. There's different examples. There's documents that have been around for the seventh, the sort of third century AD that have got runes on them. There's a, a possible reference in um, Germania, which is by Caesar, which is back in Roman times. So it's all kind of vague for both of them. But when you look at something like my other passion, which is Enochian magic by, from Dr. John Dee in the late 1500s, you know exactly when it began with John Dee and his um, research. So in a sense, the armor runes are a bit like that. You can say, well, you know where they began. They began with Von List. He might have given them a mystical background, but they begin in terms of being in the real world that we can say there they are from basically 1909 when he published The Secret of the Runes. So there is a real beginning point that you can isolate for his version. Now, that's not to mean that the, the modernized versions with the meanings that you find in the books can be should be thrown away and ignored. Not not at all, because obviously people have been making use of those ideas. And I'm very much a believer that the more people make use of something, the more you actually imbibe it with power, if you like, imbibe it with energy, with belief builds up around it. So it starts to actually work the way you want it to, because you're putting your, your will and focus into it. Now, if you... Hundreds, if not thousands of people over the last sort of, 50 years have been using this Ralph Bloom-inspired rune sets using with the same meaning and the same understanding, they're tapping into something. I really think they're actually going to work in that way. The fact that the, the history is kind of vague and lost to the mist of time almost doesn't really matter. If you really have the intended belief these things are going to work for you, then I think they can do. And as you know, I'm very much a, a believer in the concept of the collective unconscious, the kind of Jungian typology that goes on there, that these things the runes tap into that in the same way other imagery taps into the deep psyche, the deep unconscious, and you get into the level of the collective unconscious, the interconnectivity. That's how they kind of work, I think, and that's my sort of personal thinking. But, you know, it's difficult when people start saying, well, this set of runes has been used since um, Tacitus' time in ancient Rome and to the north because they couldn't get into the north because they stopped by the Germanic tribes, and those Germanic tribes in sort of 20, 20 AD were using these runes. Anyone who tells you that is just talking out their ass. They really are, because there's just no way you can possibly trace back. I mean, even the idea that these few references that exist in um, the Roman writings of Caesar and his uh, adventures north, there's debate whether even they're talking about runes. There's talking about taking up sticks. Now, the idea is that these sticks had runes carved on them, and they're using for divination before metal. It's a guess, you know, it's sort of research guess. No one really knows for certain. So that, that's the kind of problem you've got. You can have a belief that they work and it will be based in around sort of 50, 60 years of, of usage. They're not going to be because they've been around for thousands of years and they'll be used exactly the same way because they haven't been. You know, they've the meanings have never been com- completely nailed down. So, But I think a lot of these things, it, it taps into something anyway. It's, it's a way of connecting with that deep unconscious. It's a way of bringing those ideas and beliefs forward. So, there you go. Well, it's again, so much information. <laughs> <laughs> Could listen, you know, it's fascinating listening to how things have, you know, um, evolved and changed. And I can't believe that they're, although they have this history behind them, that we don't really know, really, what each symbol means. You know, until this 1909 Mr. Von List, I'm assuming I've got his name right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, one thing I wanted to know is he had, you said that he had the meanings come to him under sort of like a mystical trance whilst he was going through mm-hmm. an operation. Now, what, who is Von Nist? You know, was, did, did he know about runes before or is this just something that came 
to him? I mean, what's his particular history? OK, well, it is an interesting one because you need to rewind a little bit further back to the 1800s, mainly in the UK more than anywhere else. We saw in the late 1800s the rise of um, things like spiritualism and the theosophical society. Now, as you probably know, most of the kind of stuff you know about ghosts research these days is largely still based on Victorian ideas of the yeah. seance, the parlour. Um, all that kind of stuff. Now, that became really popular in the late Victorian period. Aside from that was where we would basically expanded as an empire, conquering a third of the world. You know, we were conquering things like India and um, Egypt, Middle East. We were bringing back to the UK ideas from those societies and cultures, things like ancient Egypt and Indian sort of myth mysticism was coming back to the UK and there was a, a moving of the Theosophical Society was trying to unify all these sort of belief systems into one greater higher goal of knowledge and understanding and the woman called Madame Blavatsky who's actually right in name gray over here was the kind of founder of the Theosophical Society here and others together kind of brought these ideas across mainly from, say, from Egypt and from India and it was very popular it was, it was really growing um in mainland Europe, particularly Central Europe, um, you had the country of Germany had only really come into existence about 50 years before. Before that, Germany was a kind of loose union of smaller states together that were kind of identified as Germany as a culture, if you like, but wasn't a nation. It had become a nation fairly recently, and it didn't really have a strong national identity. And there was a kind of movement in the late 1800s to try and build a German identity, a unity, if you like. And then it all went a bit strange, as we know. We had the First World War, but before that there was this build up of this it was nationalistic because it was about trying to carve a new nation there were I mean there were anti-Semitic tones in it but then that was a common practice in mainland Europe and you know we could look at it 21st century and see it's pretty abhorrent but it was it was a thinking that was fairly common across Europe that you know, maybe there was some kind of outside force that of making Europe less well, this part of Europe more less integrated if you like and there was a desire to build a German culture and part of that was things like runic research and ancient history was looking into sites across um, Germany. Now, this is in the 19, sort of first years of the 1900s. It was more, more legitimate research, shall we say, compared to what came later on, which I'll talk about in a minute. So you had that kind of build up, but alongside parallel, that was Germany's growing industrial strength. And then it was the desire to build its own empire and you end up with the First World War and it all kind of goes to pot. Some of the kind of, nationalism became more focused because of the second world war and there was a lot of sort of support in germany for that to try and build german as a nation to win the war of course they didn't and they were kind of people were lied to affected because the, the government had run out of funds around ability to fight the war even though it seemed like it was going okay the germany was about to collapse internally and before it completely collapsed the, the germans surrendered so there was a kind of embarrassment a loss of identity again because germany itself whilst remains as a coherent nation became a very poor nation was um, forced to pay reparations and kind of lost its self-esteem if you like sense of purpose and these ideas started to resurrect again because it became a way of focusing kind of identity, a feeling of sort of belief in each other and building up a nation. This is the 1910s into the 20s, and then you had the big stock market crash, which brought down America and, of course, affected us as well, but really destroyed Germany financially. It was slowly getting some sort of bases back together, not a lot, but it was utterly destroyed by that. And then you had the extremists come along and start grabbing hold of these ideas. So ideas like von List and the Armand Runes do get sucked into this kind of extreme right national identity kind of stuff that it turns pretty nasty. As I say, we obviously know history from then on was a particular party rise to power that does make use of some symbolism, if you like, of runes, more of a generalised, as I say, the um, so-called elder food thought that to use as a kind of uniting force. And this notion of there being an internal enemy hidden within them that caused the collapse of the German Empire as it was growing in the First World War <laughs> takes hold. And a lot of the sort of Germanic research groups kind of get either sucked into the Nazi movement or destroyed by the Nazi movement. And most of them, well, the latter, were destroyed by it. So things like the Armin Society, um, von List Society, these groups that were formed after von List passed, he died in um, 1910, I think it was, 1910, something like that. So he was long gone anyway, and his followers, some refused to be drawn into that sort of Nazification of, ru of runic ideology, uh -huh. and others embraced it. But by and large, a lot of the sort of the leaders, if you like, of the Arwenen movement disappeared or just refused to embrace it. So you have that kind of thing happening where the, 
the research gets even stranger and you start having um, the Nazis actually start creating sites of um, historic value and interest. They literally go out, they'll find an interesting area, they'll create some kind of fake history to it, like resurrect stones or hide pottery that was fake, bury it, come back a week later with the cameras and dig it all up again and say, look at this, we found this ancient proof of X, Y, Z, here's the ancient standing stones, here's some ancient pottery with um, runes that cover it. It was all nonsense, it was all made up. <laughs> the locals had actually buried it on the behest of the Nazis and then the, the, the film cameras for the newsreels came along to film them digging it all up and saying, look, here's our genuine history. So a lot of this runic research got sucked into this horrible mess of fake history and um, oh politically motivated history to, in order to legitimise a very nasty evil regime. So that was one of the big problems that the ruins have had to kind of deal with and those interested because you find on forums and groups as soon as you start talking about ruins, sooner or later the, the Nazi question arises. It's, it's unavoidable and it's terrible. It's still the case, but it is still the case. I mean, only very recently, you may not be aware of this, the... Um, the Finnish um, Olympic team for the Olympics to start later this month have been photographed with the new Olympic jerseys. They've got runes on them, and people are screaming that this is neo-Nazi stuff. It's like, what the? Are you talking about absolute nonsense? They've got some runes on them. You know, it's like, so we just give up the runes completely because the Nazis used it. Well, the Nazis used the German language. You give up the German language as well. <laughs> it's like, it's ridiculous. They can't, you know, they're saying that we have nothing to do with this movement. They you know this is not, it's runes. There's nothing Nazi about them, not Nazis symbolism. They're runes because we, you know, as a nation, we used to use runes. We've, we're connected with the runes. And yet this, the attack that we see is ridiculous. Um, all credit to them are standing by it and saying, no, we, we wear these. You know, this is us. Yeah. So. It's an excellent to see that people are making stand because it, it, we've got to do things like that to, to rescue this stuff away from, wrestle it out of the hands of the extremists. Because if you just allow them, if you say, well, we won't use them because the extremists use them, then they've won. You know, these the, the historic, and it is history to it. They're, um, they have meaning, they have value. It's just completely lost. So good on them, basically. Yeah. Um, it is something that's become very much to the fore, runes these days, particularly with shows like, I mean, we, we see the show The Vikings. It's become a very popular um, way of working now in, in regards to in ritual and stuff like that. We use runes to carve onto totems and stuff like that. You know, that they're becoming mm-hmm. quite resurrected now, aren't they? They mm-hmm. were quite, as I say, uh, not many people understood them, but now it's becoming a lot more mainstream. People are starting to use their runes. I mean, like, I know several people that pour rune a day. And use that as a personal guidance in the same way as you pull a tarot card a day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And people do daily rune readings for themselves. One thing about rune readings is they're actually quite quick and simple. <laughs> well, <you know>. yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't go simple. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, so the, the, well, the book I read was so... Oh, gosh, it was so hard to find the... Tr- it wasn't very layman termy. Um, and you know me, I like a bit of layman terms. <laughs> it was a bit too if you plough this field, then this will happen. And it was like trying to distill the real meaning out of that was like really, really hard. So um, I find them quite difficult to use. Yeah, I mean, they are mystical in the sense that it's not in black and white. You know, the interpretation is quite open. As I say, the Havamal, which is the origins for the Arman runes, many people would say that they're not runes at all. This is just, these are poems. They're descriptions of maybe magical um, operations, but they're not runes. But it, they happen to fit rather nicely when you look at the, the meanings of them and what you can say about them. It's like, well, this mean I know what, for example, Tyr, I know what it means as a rune. And you look at the, the poem lines, a twelfth I knew, if high on a tree I see a hanged man swing, I do not write or colour the runes that forth is he fares. And to me, he talks. Now, you get a connection of rune, the tear rune can mean rebirth and renewal. So a man hanging from the tea is of a, from a tree, which is a tea, <laughs> he's obviously gone, but there is a cyclical idea that you find in armor runes, but in other runes as well, this idea of being, becoming, and going away to become again. This is a line of cyclical, almost not quite reincarnation as such, but it's all cyclical power and cyclical energy. So a man hanging from a tree could be then reborn and renewed as a new god, if you want, or a new power, so a new, a higher level. Also, the connection of self-sacrifice comes in with the tier rune itself. So you can see how these kind of parallels work. But one of the things that makes them useful in a sense or interesting is they are to open to interpretation you know the direct individual meanings you might prescribe subscribe in a book 
it doesn't that's that writer's interpretation and many of those writers base what they've written on ralph bloom's book which he kind of made up i mean he's a different double-edged sword here because he did bring the runes back to life he did resurrect them from sort of the the dustbin of history if you like but um in doing so he's just carved his own version of them that's become the standardized version if you like and that that's the problem really that he's done a great service in bringing it back I and mean, we a bit like we've conversation before we've had about most haunted you know he brought um supernatural to the sort of popular attention in a, in a way that no other thing else has done in recent years but at the same time it's created all sorts of ridiculous expectations as to what the earth is about and what can be done so you know he's the double-edged sword again you've got that problem of well yeah you give it great publicity but what do we do with it now <laughs> yeah we kind <laughs> of lost it along right. the way yeah, yeah exactly. great to resurrect that but not so great because it the real meanings and the real how you work with them and the real energy behind their teachings <laughs> gets sort of a bit twisted and a bit lost. Yes, exactly. You've got someone like um, Bloom, what he's done. But, um, yeah, I mean, I'm trying to, well, not so much now, was well, certainly maybe 10 years ago, trying to really resurrect the Armour and Runes into something that the West or UK, if you like, or English-speaking people, to be more accurate, would actually make use of. I've written my own book, which is called Rune and the Secret of the Runes, and it is the first... English language book that is solely about the armament rooms to be published. There's, they've mentioned in many other books, often disparaging, as I say, as being the Nazi rooms, which I keep saying they are not. But they, they crop up in quite a few books. But the mine was the first book that's actually dedicated, dedicated directly to them, which I was quite pleased about. And um, I've crossed one of the few times with a guy called Stephen Flowers or Edward Thorson or Thorson, who is probably the, the greatest expert on the armor runes in the English language. You know, obviously there were German people know about it well because it's they are predominantly German runes. And he's of the same opinion that, that you know these things need to be resurrected. Then they might not be historically genuinely ancient, but they are specifically conceived roughly in the same way that the original runes would have been done for magical purposes but they're modern you know they've been created in the last sort of hundred years or so slightly more now, obviously but they were created for the same thing if you like they were created for the same purpose to be used magically to be used mystically yeah. so that's not really a problem the fact that they're not that old in comparison because you know everything has to have a beginning somewhere <laughs> you know so nothing yeah. To- yeah but all they've done really is create a rune set that has come from a mystical centre mm-hmm. from a place that sort of like brings all of that past knowledge, condenses it into something that is usable in mm-hmm. today's understanding of those concepts. I mean, some of those concepts, like the evolution of spirit and stuff like that, although they're touched on in things like we've talked about tarot and stuff like that, the, the runes themselves had sort of got like lost and disparate and, and dispersed across a wide range what they've done in the 1909 was bring it together into a formatted way that we can use in this time Mm, if you want to certainly the the armament runes are by far the most popular runes in central um, europe like germany etc that they are the ones they use because they recognize they are theirs if you like that's exactly where they came from the others are kind of spread around but as i say because we are influenced as you know by america quite a lot and ralph loom is an american uh, german descent american so his connection was there that's that's why they've been picked up really by um us as English speakers who the books in the English language, whereas a lot of the books on the armor runes are still in German. I mean, Carl Spiesberger wrote an excellent book on the the armor runes in the 1950s, and it, again, it, that's where they were resurrected in the in Germany was by his book, and it's far superior to the rubbish broom came out with. And unfortunately, it's still to this day not been fully translated into English. I mean, uh, there's actually a book that came out in the 70s, which was a partial translation, uncredited, and that did cause a bit of a stink. And that I've actually got a copy of. It's quite hard to get a hold of, but it, it's a partial translation of Spiesberger's book. But again, it's it still amazes me that no one's ever actually bothered to get the whole thing translated. And like, I've even got Stephen Flowers before that, you know, why isn't there one? And he said, well, in the workings, it's a project that's some way off in the future that may well occur, but at the moment he's working on other stuff. In fact, he's working on a book called Rune Might, the new edition, which um, talks about this whole period of the 1930s in Germany, he talks about some of the different versions of runes that were being used, and again, talks about the Armour runes, and quite nice for me, he's got a mention of my book in his book, which is very nice. Oh, cool. <laughs> so, which I'm really quite pleased about. But um, yeah, so it, it's because, as I say, in mainland Europe, with Germany in particular, it was the Armour runes first and foremost that came back out of the dark, you know, see if you like, through um, Spiesberger's book or Spiesberger, 
And here it's been Ralph Bloom's uh, appalling nonsense, unfortunately, that's been the main popular book that most of the more recent books, most, not all, some of more sensible, most of the, shall we say, the the more widely kind of, I hate the phrase to say, but the new agey kind of um, publishing writers tend to stick to. When you get books that talk about divination of different kinds, they always go straight for Bloom's versions of the um, Elder Futh arc without really exploring examining it. But if you want to get a real proper feel for what the Rune's historically about, you need to read people like Edward Thorson's books like um, Rune Law and Rune Magic. They'll give you much more of an idea. Uh, in fact, anything by Edward Thorson, which talks about runes, is well worth getting hold of. Do you have a proper sense of the history and the meaning of runes rather than the, so we say, the New Age mumbo jumbo? <laughs> <laughs> now, you personally um, mm-hmm. have said that you, you know, you're very knowledgeable in about Nokia magic and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Now, mm-hmm. is that what led you down to wanting to write that book about about the um, Armenian runes? Um, I don't incredibly can't really tell you. I don't know. I had an interest in the runes, and I've been a knocking of, of various things. You know, my whole sort of game of different areas of the occult. Um, I it kind of started basically. I'll be honest with you. Start with um, Lord of the Rings and um, the Tolkien's writings. This is long before the films came out. We're talking about sort of back in the sort of seventies, <laughs> reading Lord of the Rings, and obviously runes appear in that. But the version of runes that appear in that are completely um, synthetic. They're, com- they're created by uh, Tolkien. Well, they, well, they aren't. Basically, Tolkien's idea was if the runes had continued to be used as a, a, a language of meaning of communication, they would obviously develop further, growing larger, and have a different number of letters, etc. His was like a, an alternate version of the history of runes. But I've wanted to know more about the real thing. And uh, you find various books, as I say, Edward Thorson's books have been going around since the 80s. He's been writing his first book, came out in 82, I think, or something along those lines. So his books went around. So you've got different books on runes, and there were different kinds of rune designs. It looked slightly different in different books. Some of the means are slightly different. It was all a bit confusing. And then I came across his book, it's called Rune Might, the one I mentioned just now, in the first edition of that. And it talks about the Arwenon, and they were very specific, very precise design, very specific and precise meaning for each one of them that was very easy to determine. I thought, well, the other was a kind of a bit of a mismatch and not quite sure. These were much clearer to me made more sense and i've wanted to know more about them and say so i found bits and pieces in mainly Thorson's books there wasn't much else around and then i came across his edward Thorson's translation of guido von this the secret of the runes his original book on the runes which was translated into english and again in the 80s and i, I reading it was just brilliant it was it was much more kind of mystical it was much more kind of i don't know tolkien i suppose is one way of putting it but it had a much more rounded feel it was you thought you're not just reading about boring new age silly little rune things you're reading about some kind of magical system that you could really tap into so kind of connecting deep within the soul that kind of thing that's what really inspired me with those so i actually wrote the rune book around about the same time as a book on Enochian magic that was kind of bouncing between one and the other working with one system for a while then to the other one because that's just the way my brain works I can't focus on one thing at a time I've got to focus on several things at a time otherwise it just doesn't work for me so I was writing them both in the early 2000s and working with both systems sort of almost side by side and because I'm, as I said before, I'm very much a believer of this connectivity that's deep within us, that these all systems of magic ultimately connect with that deeper inner self. But yeah. the connected self that interconnects all of us, like the oneness of everything, is this is what this stuff does. It taps into that. Now, I know some people are not going to like that idea, and I've certainly had other discussions, or we say healthy discussions on Facebook about it, because it's, it's <laughs> what's often described as the... the um, I forget the bloody term now. The spiritual versus the psychological explanation for magic. There's if it's either one or the other. It's spiritual, as in these realms exist, these beings exist independently, or psychological. It's all in your head. And I've always said between the two, you know, I don't think either one fully explains anything. It's just people see it as an either or. I don't think it's somewhere between the two. There's a, a definitely an inter- a interconnectivity of these things. I don't think they exist independently of us. None of this stuff does, but there's interconnectivity that's deep within us all that connects this kind of stuff. So both systems tap into that in different ways. So that's why I find them fascinating. But that's why I like the Armaments particularly is because it wasn't so... Um, 
it was more coherent, more cohesive than a lot of the other stuff you see, other than when you recognise, as I say, the early, the, the stuff that was available, New Age, I'm sorry if I'm offending with that term, but that's why I describe it, um, was made up. It was modernised. It was, I think Thornton's work really got me onto that fact that, that what you were seeing, it wasn't genuinely historic. It was just a version that had grown out of some of the writing of the 1930s and then reborn in the 50s. So Yeah, and that's what I find interesting about it, is like when you are working in that way, when you when you're out of it, you go. But that, was that just in my mind? Was that when I did that? Was that just where did that come from? Do you know what I mean? How how mm. did my mind make that up? Because I didn't know about that or think about. Oh, when I was doing that, that wasn't what I was thinking of. So how does that work? And was that something completely different? And and it is. You're, you're right. It's that two sides: the psychological versus the spiritual. And even working with it within yourself you have those questions so it's Mm. not just what somebody says and you sound bonkers sometimes when you're trying to explain (laughs) it to somebody i mean i've sat there and talked over concepts with you before now and i'm sitting there thinking god if anyone's listening to this they're gonna think she's absolutely bonkers do you know what (laughs) i mean and Mm -hmm. it is that very psychological versus spiritual it's exactly that because your logical brain is going that's probably just something from your deep subconscious that's come through because you've got yourself into that specific mental state um, and you're, you're working with symbols and you're working with incense that's triggering things and, mm. you know, but then you go, but that had an effect. Yeah, exactly. I gave up a long time ago trying to fully, completely explain it because I don't think you can. As I say, it's somewhere between the two. You know, neither explanations, spiritual or psychological, explain everything. Neither one of them do. So you can't say that it is X or Z. It's Y, the one between the two. Why? Why is it happening that way? Why does this occur and this not occur? I know from experiences, you tend to, as long as you keep things very precise and specific to make something work, then it tends to work, but you have to do it very specifically. And being kind of wishy-washy and vague, all you're going to do is basically nothing. You know, people often say, oh, I shouldn't dabble with this, you know, bad thing. Well, you don't dabble because nothing happens. It's like, you know, if you, I said this on you before, you pick up your phone, average phone number's got like eight, nine numbers. If you dial random numbers but don't dial enough numbers, what happens? Nothing. Exactly. <laughs> So if you don't do it properly, nothing happens effectively. So, you know, people often get disgruntled and give up and think, oh, no, this doesn't work. I've tried this and nothing. Well, you probably haven't done it properly. You miss something out. Now, why you have to do these things specifically? So, for example, if you're working with a knock-in, for example, because it doesn't quite work with runes because they are, they can be very much root one simplistic way of working. There are much more deeper mystical ways of working with the runes, but... You, with a knock-in again it's it tends to be more complex but you have to follow the correct steps to actually achieve things why i don't know you know i don't i can't tell you why but i know from experience things don't tend to work unless you do them properly which just being the question does that mean there must be something separate that's going on that you're connecting with in order to make that connection work i don't know but you know you do something don't do something properly it doesn't tend to work in the real world so mm. if you do this kind of stuff of course it's gonna be the same if it doesn't do it properly it isn't gonna work properly yeah, very much so. There are steps that you have to for, fulfil to be yeah. able to get that interconnectivity. I, I'm with you on that. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've been talking a lot about working in the proper processes, even down to um, basics, and a lot of people are missing the point. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a lot of fluff out there, a yeah. lot of fluff um, out there. And um, it's great that people are embracing ways of working um, and lots of different ways of working as well. You know, I mean, there's lots of talk of right-hand path, left-hand path, make it your own, do what you will. But there are set processes within that that you have to do. You have to take Mm. those steps. And if you are going to connect, whether or not it's psychologically or spiritually or both, then it's about fulfilling those steps to, in order for that process to happen. Absolutely. I mean, obviously, you can experiment and develop your own systems, and people that do develop their own systems of magic that actually seem to work. But again, it, you know, I think you're tapping into something that's, that's operated for a period of time. So, let's say with the Ralph Bloom stuff, is say you, the, the stuff that's come out from his variation of runes recently, I'll say recent last 50 years, it seems, it seems to work for some people because I think people are working with it over and over again, even if it's still a say, modern, made up thing. They're working with it, therefore, it's. Um, 
you're feeding energy into it, if you like. You're actually putting an intent into it. And more and more people do that, the more the intent becomes more manifest, if you like. It's yeah. the kind of way it can definitely work. It's just like, um, you know, you, you build a path between two places and the path goes a bit meandering and people want to go more directly across. They start, they ignore the path, they don't walk around the path, they go straight across, across the grass. You keep doing that and more people do that and then eventually you create a new path because they've obviously carved its way through. And magic can be like that. If you're the pioneer pushing forward, you're the first one treading on that grass, you might not get much of an effect because you're the first to really work it. But if you keep working it and working it and working it, then you start to create something. And I think that's, that's what can happen, that you do create something new. The alternative is that you just find another way of connecting the same connections that already existed so you know you, you might walk that path and discover underneath actually there's a path underneath this mud that's been built over but the path's already there so you follow that same path it's a bit like you know you whether you phone somebody with the latest iphone or you phone someone with an old nokia with this with the flip down cover thing it'll probably still work you get the connection to work of course it doesn't matter if it's an old phone or a new phone if it's connected to the one that's already existed are you ringing the person who's got the phone? Then it's going to work. It doesn't have to be brand new. So you see what I'm saying? You can remodel something that already exists in order to create a new system with it. So in a sense, you could say that's what the von List rooms did. They kind of remodeled what was already there yeah. and kind of codified it more deeply. And then they work the same way the older runes do because they're following that same runic path. Because you won't get anyone, I don't believe, who will say to you, well, that Futh art works, so therefore all the others don't. I, you know, you will get researchers who will use more than one variation. Right. Let's say someone in the 1930s uncovered 22 variations, complete sets of um, the Germanic or Elder Food Arc. Yeah, I don't think you would say, well, that one works, that one doesn't work, because they were, they were based on historic examples of um, objects that have been found, you know. It's like the the best example of the Anglo Frasian or Anglo Saxon Futhog is the the Thames Samahax or Samahax. I can't quite say it. it's a sword basically that was found right. in the Thames that has the complete um, Anglo Frasian or Anglo Saxon Futhog written on its side, about thirty characters. You know that's one of the best examples of that particular set of runes that has been found. It's on one item and it's dropped in the sea, but it's just the full list of the characters. It's not it doesn't say anything. It's just the hatch, the actual characters. Mm. So that's obviously resisted for some time. So, yeah, I mean, it, generally this sort of stuff, it depends how you want to work. If you want to pioneer your new system, okay, it, you have to follow certain um, ways of working in order to create the effect you're looking for. You know, if you if you want to, say you want to build a new path, you're not going to start sort of, I don't know, putting saucepans down on the path to say that's my path because that looks ridiculous. <laughs> you know, you've got to <laughs> use bricks and mortar and whatever, you know, just to cart to create a new pathway. Yeah, you it put takes that, time and energy and knowledge. Yeah. And the right know, materials. And the right materials, yeah. yeah. Put a banana down, it ain't going to work very well. For new, my new path made of bananas, what do you think? Yeah, yeah. No, you tend to step on them <laughs> and slip on that pathway. Exactly. <laughs> That's the point. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, do you think it's. Um, we talk about resonating. If something's working for you, it's resonating with you, then go with that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you think with the rise of modern media, with TV shows and films, and these concepts and these ideas that are coming forward in these modern day representations, people are starting to resonate with these old methodology methodologies. Can't say it. You know Method- what I meant by that. <laughs> methodologies. That's the word. <laughs> um, because they're becoming more in people's heads. Like I mean, we talked about the Vikings. They're seeing that kind of lifestyle. It's all very sexed up for the tv do you know what i mean it, it, people are going oh yeah i'm voking do you know what i mean and <laughs> so then they'll start working with and it's bringing runes more into the forefront and so people are going mm. actually i'm resonating with that yeah it's a positive thing, I think. I mean, it's, TV is a bit difficult because, of course, we're talking about the fact that things like the Vikings TV series is made off the back of the success of um, Game of Thrones, which was built on the back of the success of Lord of the Rings. So it's a yeah. continual kind of, you know, this style of thing works really well. I mean, there's a new one about, I think, called Britannia that's now on that's sort of oh, based around yeah. a Roman invasion, which apparently everyone is slating, saying it's truly dreadful. Yeah. But there are 
in a sense, they're all complete nonsense because we don't really know what life was like back in those days at all. Very little writing has survived, very little material has survived. We know a fair bit about Roman life because, of course, they did actually write and keep records. But the so-called Dark Ages after the collapse of the Roman Empire are called the Dark Ages for that reason. I know very little about it. So it's all modern constructs. The Viking TV series, it's 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 lovely. It looks good. It's got some great music in it. But it's, it's about as real as Star Wars. You know, it's... <laughs> if, if, if Sorry to not, break everybody's heart out there but you know that's not really like historically correct guys <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's historically real as game of thrones is you know but if it inspires interest and people start looking for the genuine history and find that there's connections with this stuff that goes way back it's part of your old your own history your culture etc then that's great but again don't Generate, degenerate anybody else's culture because it's different to yours. You know, it's, it's nice to find your identity and sense of your history, but you know, don't use it as a weapon to bash other people, basically, which is a common problem these days, unfortunately. Well, unfortunately, it does seem to be the case. But if you resonate with it, um, and you've seen a concept on one of these shows, then learn about it. Go away, do your research, read these books because you will Absolutely. learn so much more from that than learning your history from a show. Yes, or, exactly. Or the meaning of something from a show. Go away, do your research. If it still resonates with you, then go ahead, use that. No different from some people prefer an angel oracle deck to a tarot deck. You know, mm-hmm. it, it's down to finding a, the tool, if you're going to work with the tool, for what works for you. Yeah, I mean, I, can't, I don't resonate with runes particularly well at all. It's mm. only recently I've started looking into certain magical practices and runes are starting to come forward and I'm starting to go, okay, I'm going to need to know a little bit more about this. But actually, as a form of a divination, um, I, I don't resonate with them in that way at all. I resonate mm. better with a tarot deck. But that's a personal thing. That's just a personal thing. I might change and evolve and end up being better with runes than I was with tarots. I don't mm. know, but that's part of an evolution of learning and knowledge and mm. methodology of working methodology got it right that time yes, of working <laughs> <laughs> so for yourself i know you've read tarot cards haven't you and Many. i know it was a long time ago and you've looked into a lot of magical practices mm-hmm. and now you've written this book on runes what's your preferred method of um working shall we say um well if you mean with divination or mm, yeah. Generally. With um, a tool, with a tool is where I'm going, really. Sure, I don't. <laughs> the answer is I don't. You don't? <laughs> no, no, I don't use any kind of divination. I don't look into the future or anything like that. I like to see what's going to happen. Let, the world, let it evolve by itself. I gave up looking a long time ago. I might as well enjoy the journey of just seeing what comes next. Um, so, no, I don't use any system. I have um, totally tend to work more mystically, shall we say, with meditation and um, contemplation of things. And what I'm working on at the moment is very much sort of contemplation dread, driven, a lot of research. I mean, I'm not saying much about what I'm working on at the moment because it's all a bit quiet at the moment, but I am working on another book at the moment, which has really gripped me and it's quite fascinating. But I don't want to say too much, but it's more research. I mean, there's practical elements to it, which I can make use of, but I tend to be more shall we say more mystical if you like i tend to focus on meditation work now i don't mean kind of sitting there going oh i'm sort of deep thought about imagery and contemplating the meanings of things and you know following certain ritual stuff of my own but it's it's say it's more kind of head work i don't sort of like candles or have incense or that kind of stuff I mean, i've got all the stuff here but i just don't use it <laughs> i must admit I, don't use it <laughs> I find this working directly with the brain tends to produce a kind of effect i'm looking for if you like as i say you're always working on something and it's always fascinating what you do come out with (laughs) (laughs) and your knowledge is absolutely fascinating now for somebody like myself i don't retain Mm -hmm. information particularly well it's a well-known fact um and i surprise myself (laughs) sometimes when somebody will say something and i'll go oh i know that (laughs) where did that come from because i don't actually remember it um How do you remember? How do you know what you know? How do you keep that in your brain so you can access it in the level you've done tonight? (laughs) Only, perfectly honestly, just have a phenomenally good memory. Just have a very good memory. Like, read and retain stuff. I don't don't know why, I don't know how, what's come about, but just have a very good memory. It's not fair. No, no, not at all. I mean, it's not photographic or anything. I don't sort of just see, I just retain it. I don't know. I honestly couldn't tell you. I tend to read a lot and I don't just sit and read a book. I'll sort of 
sit with a notebook and taking notes and writing down the things I find interesting. And that's that's a technique back from university days. You know, when you're trying to learn something, go to a lecture, don't just sit and listen because you won't take it all in. You've got to take notes. Even if you're writing down what's being said to you, just yeah. rewriting it and reviewing what you've written. But no, there's no particular tricks or anything. It's not. I don't pray to the great god brain or something. I don't sort of you know sacrifice goats to the god of memory. <laughs> just, oh, there's me getting works. my goats already. <laughs> 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 it's okay you're going to be saved tonight it's nothing to do with sacrifice <laughs> I, uh, I have a vast number of synaptic connections is probably all I can really say <laughs> well I need to I don't know eat some super food or something to increase those <laughs> anyway we have actually come to the end of the show so thank you so so much for joining me in the yeah. studio tonight again I do apologise we were a little late to start but um, I love talking to you you always bring something fascinating to the table for me and I uh, always go away having learned something, and that I like to do that. I like that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> thank so thank you. Uh, don't forget, guys, we have shows going out every single night of the week, apart from Saturday nights. Tomorrow night is the Parasearch UK Radio Encore Show um, with Jay Lynch. Great topic um, we discussed last week. Tuesdays is the Paranormal Concept Show. Uh, we're, we're finding Atlantis, would you believe? We're, gonna, we're actually going to find it. I'm telling you now. Good luck um, with that. I know. <laughs> on Wednesday, we've got the double bill going on with Sean Cadman and the Supernatural sh- Chat Show and Penny G. Morgan with our Haunted Histories. On Thursday evening, we've got the lovely Kaz Rooney in the studio with the Spectral Zone. And Friday evening, we are back with the Dark Mirror Show. And on that note, don't forget, check our Facebook pages. We're also on YouTube. Go subscribe so you know when a new show has gone up. On that note, I'm going to say farewell. <laughs> Thank mm-hmm. you so much, Andy, for joining us. No and, problem. And no doubt I'll be having you on again very, very soon. Thank you so much and good night. Bye. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to join us for more shows throughout the week. Find us on Facebook, Twitter and the World Wide Web to keep up to date with all the shows right here on Parasearch Radio.